Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Two Degrees Virtual Roundtable. Thank you very much for tuning in and being there. My name is Tom Idle. Uh, I'm the editor of Two Degrees, and I'm going to be your chair for this panel discussion, which I'm sure will offer us a good insight into the subject for today, which is the growing and, and very real problem of urban waste and, and what the business community can do to tackle some of the issues that feed into that. So we've got some great panellists lined up to tackle the subject. Uh, joining us from Veolia Environmental Services, we have Richard Kirkman, who is uh, the Head of Design, Technology and Operations. Good afternoon, Richard. Hello, everyone. And in a few moments, Richard is really going to sort of get us underway with an introduction into some of the challenges facing the, the, the sector right now. Uh, also on the panel, we have Richard Mason, who is the Environment Impl Implementation Manager at the UK retailer ASDA. So good afternoon, Richard. Good afternoon. And we have Patrick McGuirk on the line as well. Uh, Patrick heads up recycling at Coca-Cola Enterprises. Patrick, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And hopefully joining us soon, I'm not too sure if he's on the line yet, Alex Gibbs will hopefully be joining us. Um, Alex is, looks after the environmental health, safety and quality at Philips Electronics. So hopefully Alex will join us in a moment. I notice he's not quite with us yet, but hopefully he will be soon. Um, anyway, so thank you very much for all being there as our, as our panellists. So we're going to hear from Richard Kirkman first. Richard's presentation is going to last for about five minutes, after which we're going to go straight into the sort of live panel discussion. Uh, and we're going to try and structure the conversation under six uh, key headline topics, which you can see on the screen right now. Um, and as well as hearing what our panellists think, we'd also like everyone listening to get involved with this by sending in your questions and really getting involved in the discussion. And you can do this throughout the webinar, anytime, using the Q&A box on the, the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. You just type in your question, uh, press Submit, uh, and we'll try and answer as many of your questions as we go along throughout the, uh, the next hour or so. Um, if you have any technical issues during the, the session, you can't hear the presenters or whatever it might be, then please um, use the, the chat box on the right-hand side. Send me a message, and, and I'll try and get back to you as quick as I can and, and try and rectify that. So let's get going. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Richard, uh, who's really going to sort of kick things off for us. Richard. Okay, thanks for that introduction. Um, well, we're really pleased today to be able to um, talk about um, our third waste manifesto, and that's really the context of uh, this sustainable cities um, introduction for you today. Um, over half the world's population now live in cities, and by 2050, that's expected to be around 70%. So with more people living in cities, they need to become more sustainable. And we think that really puts the onus on businesses, industry, local authorities, and also ourselves, the recycling sector, to ensure that cities have this cleaner, greener future. We think that despite the economic downturn and the difficulties that faces businesses, there are still leverage points with legislation and other business opportunities so we can find that sustainable route. And with that in mind, we launched our third manifesto, as I said, that has seven or eight key points where we think there are opportunities to do these things. So uh, one of the key ones is collecting food waste. There's seven million tons of food waste thrown away each year. Some of it can't be avoided, and we think that accepting that separate collection can be a win-win for both business uh, and communities in the long term is a good way to approach that. We think that rolling out more commingled recyclates uh, within local authorities, but also increasing the amount of recyclates collected by businesses has got to happen, and we need to work together to find a way for that to happen. If I just click to the next slide... So we've launched this manifesto. We've got our key points in there. We think the, the, the revised waste framework directive may be a real one of the opportunities for us. It's been uh, in legislation for about a year now, but on the ground it hasn't really had an effect yet. And the guidance and the way that's going to work within industry and society is just being panned out. They're talking about end-of-waste regulations and how things that were a waste will become a non-waste and go back into the economic cycle. And it's a real opportunity for us to... Uh, work together to make that happen in a way which provides a business opportunity and also leads to the better sustainable outcome. The other side of the coin is the energy from the waste that can't be recycled. There's huge opportunities for waste heat to be used. 
we operate seven of the UK's uh, energy from waste facilities that produce electricity. One of those facilities, and only one of them at the moment, produces a significant amount of heat which goes back uh, into local authority buildings but also businesses in Sheffield. We'd like to roll that out to all the seven plants that we operate, and that means working with uh, businesses and communities in order to put the pipeworks in so that we can deliver that heat. And that can be a business benefit because it will be lower than the cost of gas or the cost of oil to heat buildings and to heat processes and to provide steam to processes. You can see there on that slide the, the way that we view the, the circular economy. That, that the circular economy has been talked about now for at least 20 years, um, and so far it's really meant taking materials, trying to recycle them, trying to put them back into routes where they're reused. But I think we've only really just touched on the edges of that in terms of reclaiming those materials as not a non-waste and confirming that they're not a waste anymore and selling them as a product. So that's really a, a sea change. And the, as I say, the Waste Framework Directive has brought around these end-of-waste regulations. We've got the mechanisms in place to do that, and we can work together to make sure that that benefits both sides of business. And then finally, for the hazardous waste, We've included one point on hazardous waste. It's, it's a topic that people don't always want to talk about, but we feel it's really important to treat hazardous waste correctly. The reason being, if you remove them from the waste streams, then all the other materials become much more easily recyclable and can go back into the, into the product chain. So bringing all those things together, um, the hazardous waste, the recyclable materials, the food waste and the energy recovery, we really think they are the key points and the key ways that we can introduce this sust sustainable cities concept to have a really pragmatic approach to it, something we can do on the ground and something that we can actually make happen as a business. Richard, thank you for that. That's um, really give us a, a good scene setter and give us some, uh, some context to, as to some of the, the challenges, but crucially the, the, the opportunities that are out there, and then there's plenty of those. So let's, let's bring in our, our other panellists right away. And, and what I want to do is, is, is work our way through some of these discussion areas. And uh, I'm going to be posing a few questions to our panellists. But I really want you, the audience, to get involved. Send us your questions, and we can feed those into the conversation as we, as we go along. So please do that. Um, perhaps we could start with, with you, Richard, Richard Mason. Two Richards today, um, all very confusing. But Richard Mason uh, at ASDA. Uh, Richard, perhaps you could sort of paint a picture for us of the, of the current waste challenges you face as a business. I mean, ASDA has this overarching uh, sustainability strategy, but I wonder where, you know, how dealing with your waste sits within that overarching objective. Yes, um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, it sits, I mean, it's very central to it. Our targets actually come directly from Walmart in the US. So we have a global target around uh, zero waste to landfill. Um, so every country has to report monthly to Walmart on, the, on that target, um, which we're currently at 96% roughly. Um, we've worked very closely with Veolia, which for many years has been our incumbent uh, waste management company, to achieve that. Um, but I think it, it's very much changing um, in terms of what our overall objective is. We've got very close to zero waste to landfill. And the closer we get, there's more important issues, and that's where can we increase the recyclers coming through our stream how can we work with Veolia on um, initiatives off the back of their MRFs when our materials go through? And one of the key ones for us is actually we currently have compactors in store, which some of the retailers have moved to actually remove them from their stores. Um, and it's a bit like a black hole for waste, and it's all around education of our colleagues and how do we, A, find a solution for everything that's currently going in the compactor, which we're working on, um, and B, how do we actually educate our colleagues to the point where they know how to segregate waste properly, which allows us to recycle as much as possible and divert not only from landfill, but where possible from energy recovery as well. Yeah. Um, so it does tend to come down to segregation. We have processes um, for different food wastes, um, but ultimately they do get contaminated from time to time, and it sort of makes people reluctant to introduce more waste streams at the back of house. Yeah, sure. I and mean, we're going to touch on the whole issue of, of engaging those around you in-house uh, a bit later on. Um, how far away is the kind of zero waste to landfill for you guys? I, I don't think it's far away at all. I think a lot of it depends on what facilities. So if you actually look at our estate, we have about 7.5% of our waste goes to energy recovery, which obviously we'd like to reduce over time as well. Um, 
But the remaining 4% that goes to landfill, it's in places where there are no facilities available to handle that waste. So rather than Veolia or CETA chucking it halfway across the country to a suitable facility and having a much larger carbon impact, for example, we've not done it. So where the facilities are available, as everybody knows, it's usually financially viable not to send it to landfill now. Um, so, yeah, it tends to be in places where we don't have the correct facilities available to us. Sure, sure. And what about you, Patrick, at Coca-Cola Enterprises? Perhaps you could explain a bit more about the business itself. And I know you guys have, have, have ambitions for, for zero waste to landfill too, don't you? Yeah, I, I, on the zero waste to landfill, we're not far off being there. We're at 99.8%, so within the next um, 12 months, we'll be at zero waste out of our manufacturing facilities. In a sense, I almost see that as yesterday's news, though. Um, I think that's just a... A requirement for doing business today. In fact, you know, I look at Asda as one of our customers. If we weren't in a place where we could arrive in Leeds and be able to tell that story, then um, Richard and some of his colleagues wouldn't be particularly impressed that their suppliers weren't in that sort of um, place. I think that the debate's gone a bit beyond that. And um, I thought it was very interesting looking at that circular economy slide and discussion there that what I often say is you've got to play at all parts of the value chain. So it's not an a la carte menu on that circular economy. If you're a serious uh, business that wants to um, wants to be positive from a circular economy perspective, you've then got to play at all points in the chain. Now, it might not mean that you actually need to directly intervene, but you need at the minimum to be influencing a part of the value chain. I think that's one of the challenges, certainly as I look at it, as um, with the distributor and um, the, the franchisee for Coca-Cola in Western Europe. And when I look at it in any of our markets, that's the first challenge is to say, how from cradle to cradle are we going to at minimum influence um, our packaging as it goes on the on the journey around the circular economy? Um, yeah. So I, I think that's you know quite an interesting concept, and it makes it more complex than some projects I see, which are very interesting and very positive, but maybe only intervene in one part of the value chain. Mm. And and who's who's driving this? Is it, I mean, is it is it the the suppliers, the 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 the, the Asda and the Tesco's and and the like that are really sort of driving action at your end, Patrick? Um, it's important. We're we're um, positively obsessed with with our customers, which I think is a very good thing. And um, yeah, whether it's, it's Carrefour in France, where it's Albert Hein in the Netherlands, where it's Asda in the UK, there's a level of expectation there. But I think for us, it's also about driving um, a positioning of our brand and our business with consumers. Um, and while they may not buy a product over another product because, inverted commas, it's green or we've delivered a better recycling or sustainable packaging journey for it. Um, yeah. We know that increasingly it's part of that quality mix. Once upon a time, quality was just about delivering a safe product identically time after time anywhere in the world. It's now about delivering a project that, uh, a product rather that's got, got fundamentally a lower carbon footprint. So the real driver for us is um, we've made a corporate commitment to reduce by one third the carbon footprint of each pack by 2020, I know a half of that carbon's in the packaging and whether that packaging's recycled. So if we don't act across the value chain, then we won't deliver on that commitment. So that, that's the big driver, really, is you know we make that bold commitment. We tell that commitment, be it to suppliers, be it to customers, be it to consumers. But to get there, we know we've got to take material action the whole way through the value chain. Sure, sure. Let's, let's have a look at one of the questions that's come through from, from our audience. Um, I don't know who wants to pick up on this, but it's a, it's, a, it's a groan rather than a question. It says, why is industry using materials that, that can't either be recycled, reclaimed, or disposed of safely? Uh, any thoughts on that? I don't know, Richard Kirkman, you want to come in on that one? Well, it's, it's one of the areas that we've been talking to industry about for, for many years. And, you know, if you, look, if you look back 20 years, packaging was very different to, to what it is like today, and I'm sure 20 years hence it's going to be different. But I think... You know, people have seriously started looking at the life cycle now. It's a very complex life, life cycle for packaging, and we will move into into a phase where it becomes more sustainable. It's going to take industry a long time to do it. You know, we discuss this with our clients and the serious ones, such as the people on this call. You know, are reacting to that over time. Yeah. Okay. Well, another question for you, actually, Richard. It, it says that um, this is from Andrea Diaz. She'd like to know know how Veolia tackles. Challenges in developing countries, which in most cases do not achieve sorting and recycling at formal stages. Sorry, can you? Where's the question? I I I I'll, I'll read it to you. It's Andrea yeah, sorry, Diaz. She, yeah. she says she'd like to know how Violia tackles these challenges in developing countries. Okay. 
when well, it's it, I mean, in developing countries, they are doing recycling as well. I mean, it depends what you consider to be a developing country. We talked about you know, emerging economies uh, some for some time now, and places like China, Brazil, they have emerged. They're, they're now growing economies. Um, if you look at China as an example, that's producing more packaging than, than we do. So I think the recycle levels there are probably higher. Um, I mean, the whole waste management sector is different in the emerging economies to it is in the UK, and I think it's a, it's a kind of a different discussion. Um, you know, their whole basis of import of energy and the flow of materials around the world is uh, it's, a, it's a complex discussion, that one. Sure. It's sure. Patrick here, could I just come in on that maybe from a Coca-Cola perspective? Because I think that's one of the challenges we face globally is um, what, um, you know, we're very proud of what we did on recycling around the Olympics. And I've had various parts of what we call the Coca-Cola system globally um, in the last couple of months coming to say, look, how do we replicate that in Latin America or how do we replicate that in Asia? And the reality is the market dynamics are so different mm. in different parts of the world that it's very difficult to cut and paste. You, you know, the same principles in terms of how you build intervention or investment can play out, but fundamentally what those interventions, investments look like are very different because um, the ownership of the material, the cost of labor, um, the grey economy versus the, the real economy, these are all major factors. You know, who, 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 who's actually driving the waste agenda from a waste management company perspective? You know, these are things that are very different in, you know, just within Western Europe, let alone on a global basis. So um, it's very difficult to actually replicate and, and, as I say, impossible to cut and paste, generally speaking. Mm. Uh, Richard Mason from Asda here as well. Um, I completely agree with Patrick there. Um, Walmart obviously has um, businesses in various countries, and it's so complex. We do have a zero waste to landfill target globally, but each country faces so many different challenges, um, and quite often the landfill isn't the key one. So an example that came to you this week was in Brazil, where there's a huge problem with um, children and people working on actual open sites. So actually the the step before organised landfill is the issue, um, and Walmart invested, or the Walmart Foundation had invested a great deal of money in setting up um, local cooperatives in Brazil to actually recycle and handle the waste properly. So it just gives you an idea of how complex it is and how different in some of these countries it is, but it is still taken very seriously. Yeah. I, I just want to take one more before we move on the discussion from Kristen Watkins. She says, is waste to energy really zero waste to landfill? throw that one out there demands a response well <laughs> we only put any materials for, for waste to energy when when it's a non-recyclable material i mean you know the first objective is and, and it's often missed when we're talking about uh, integrated waste management it's it's about prevention first it's about reuse then it's about recycling um, then it's about energy recovery and there's different forms of energy recovery we can recover energy from the food by anaerobic digestion or we can make compost um and, th and then there's energy from waste where we recover energy from the non-recyclable materials. There is a small component of uh, material that we use to clean the gases before they go um, up the chimney to make sure that everything's safe and that we, we use in other processes as um, a neutraliser for waste acids from uh, other uh, industries. So there's, there's probably 1% um, that it doesn't go to landfill, it actually goes to um, permanent storage. Uh, we, but it isn't it isn't directly recycled, and uh, you know we wouldn't hide from that one percent that goes that route because what we're always looking at when we're doing these things is what is the best option for these materials, and then once we've found that best option, what can we do that's better? And that's that's what the joy is, I think, of working with people like Asda and Coca Cola, who we do work with, is that they they're open to that conversation. We'll do something, yeah. and then the next day we'll say, well, there's that one percent there. What can we do with that? And it's all about yeah. getting the next step, the next the next perfection of the process. So let, let's stay with that theme of, of kind of collaborating with, with our suppliers and, and along the chain then. Um, Richard, I know you guys at Asda have worked really hard to sort of encourage collaboration. And uh, what, what's the sort of secret to making that happen? Um, I don't know. With waste, it's been, it's been a difficult one. I wouldn't say we're as, far, we're as advanced as we are in other areas um, working with our supply chain. I mean, we work very closely with our waste management companies in terms of Veolia. Um, and are always looking for opportunities to tie that in. So one of the big challenges for the coming years, I guess, would be can we help some of our suppliers in handling their waste? Is there some things we can take back through our depot system that allow them to sort of get the same scale that we have in order to, to get the same prices, get the same amount of material recycled? 
Um, but I think, I think it's just having that open book, that honesty that you can actually work with us without us um, just purely looking at the money side of things. Oh, oh. And, and, and for you, Richard, Kirkman, um, yeah. I mean, engagement along the supply chain is obviously crucially important. And I mean, I don't know if you've seen this on the, on the Two Degrees platform. We've been running a, a discussion thread looking at the need to educate businesses about the risks of, of water scarcity and water efficiency. And I wonder whether the same sort of lack of education and understanding exists around waste, and particularly around the sort of the thing you described earlier, the whole circular economy. What, what's your experience and, and, uh, and, and, and thoughts around that? Well, you know, I think people are very mature about this now. The, the reason we've we reached 95, 96, 97% with customers pretty easily is not because we couldn't find a route for the last 4%. It's probably because it's a long way to transport it. Does it really make sense to do that? Is that even sustainable to do that? Is that the best option? So we can have that mature discussion. And, and at the same time, I think things are changing really quickly because we have moved from a position where landfill largely was the option to having MBT facilities, which is mechanical biological treatment and solid fuel production facilities, energy recovery, recycling facilities all over the UK, and which are still quickly expanding, even in a shrinking economy. So the options have opened up. The discussion has become much more mature. And it just means that we can make good decisions and, and, and bring things forward all the time. Yeah. And Patrick, what what does your supply chain look like? Um, I think our supply chain, in some senses, is is a lot simpler than some. Um, you know, we've done the carbon analysis, and if you look at our ten largest suppliers, they make up approximately sixty to seventy five percent of our overall um, supply footprint, which is quite a convenient place to be because you can. And go after some big rocks as a result. I think it'd be rather different if I if I if I sat sat, sat in uh, the hot seat in Leeds with ASDA because the far broader supply base. So that I think in one sense makes it easier to collaborate because you can partner with a smaller number of businesses in order to drive significant change. So, um, but I I think one of the other observations, and it comes back to that point around you know where energy from waste sits on the hierarchy. I mean, I broadly agree with what Richard said in terms of that hierarchy, but sometimes you're surprised with what it looks like. I, we recently um, had a project, I won't go into the detail on the pack, but there was a pack where there was a new recycling solution, true recycling solution, not pack to pack, but alternative um, use. And actually, when we did the L life cycle analysis, the LCA, um, the, um, we were far better sending it to EFW, send it to, for incineration to, to get the carbon value that way um, by a, a factor of nearly 70%. So I think increasingly as, um, as, as we become better at interrogating the data and understanding the business case in this sort of area, um, you, you, you really understand that the hierarchy isn't as simple as you might anticipate. Some of the steps that people would perceive as being obvious actually aren't necessarily the right ones to take. And also you get to a place where I can see the day where we'll have as many carbon analysts in our business as we have accountants. So um, if, that's not, if that's not getting quickly onto university and, and training courses, then it soon will do. Um, but, th yeah, that, that's kind of my take on it there. Okay. And, and I was going to ask what, what the, the role of, of Veolia um, and, and waste contractors like it play in, in, in encouraging supply chain collaboration and, and what you guys would like to see more from, from the waste management industry. Is there anything that's sort of missing that you'd like to see them more help with? Perhaps, perhaps Richard Mason Asda. Sorry, could you repeat that? I lost that side there. I, I was going to say what the role of the likes of Veolia, the waste contractor, can play in encouraging collaboration in the supply chain and, and what you guys would like to see more of from, from the waste management industry. Yeah, I mean, Veolia have helped us greatly. I think as we move into the next step of working with suppliers, we need them to be open and honest. I think being able to speak to your waste management company and, and feel like they are they are trying to do what's best as opposed to just defend their contract um, is a big step. And I think Veolia are very good at that. Um, but I, th I think as we move forward, yeah, we need to, we need a sort of grown up approach to this. Um, where it's two way where if we if we find a solution for something we can actually go to the area and say you know what if you put our waste through your MRFs what are you actually doing with the plastic off the back of that um, and that's where we can go to suppliers like Patrick at Coke and say well actually we've got a load of PET coming through our stores um, we'd actually quite like to close loop that for example into into a Coke bottle but 
can we do that? Because I think historically, the likes of Veolia have been used as a waste disposal company, and once it's left store, it's gone, and it's no longer the responsibility of ASDA, and I think we're trying to change that. Sure. What about, what was, what's your experience, Patrick? I, I, yeah, I think the challenge, and sort of hinting at it there, um, is the quality agenda. So, you know, if we're looking at this from a British perspective, you know, my role, I'm looking at other European countries, it's sometimes quite embarrassing to be a recycling director and a Brit, pa- British passport in your hand when we're, quite frankly, a poor-performing Western European economy in this space. And part of that then leads to a pressure to deliver much increased um, yeah, amounts of material that is recycled, um, often without recognition that the quality is as, if not more, important. Um, and therefore, I, I, in some sense, I feel for the waste management companies such as Veolia because they're delivering contracts for be it commercial or, or public sector partners who are very much under pressure to deliver that, that, that bigger number year on year, whereas actually delivering quality year on year is, as I say, a, a, um, as important. And I think that's one of the challenges right now for, for the waste management industry is to satisfy that desire to deliver big, bigger percentages whilst also driving the circular economy, because bigger percentages often actually um, work against the circular economy. Um, so that, that I, for me, that's really probably the biggest challenge of the industry today, and it's one that um, certainly we're um, encouraging government to grasp, because um, it, if it's not driven from, from Whitehall and Westminster in terms of um, recognising what that needs to be and setting a, a really clear framework, then it's very difficult for industry to deliver to those two, two conflicting requirements. Richard, I've got another specific question actually aimed at the, the, the waste management industry about electrical products. Um, one of our members says, with so many more electrical products out there and reducing raw materials to produce them, what plans are in place for waste management companies and electrical companies in recovering these vital materials from old or damaged electrical goods? Well, yeah, we're looking closer and closer at that. I mean, the, the legislation on waste, electrical, and electronic equipment is... Uh, quite tight the recovery rates are going to go up and you know things like precious metals the platinums the golds um, they, they're going to be things that we're going to be recovering from waste streams because they're going to become valuable enough to take out in smaller and smaller quantities so we're constantly reviewing that technology is there um, we, we're just waiting for that tipping point where those small very very small quantities uh, can be economically reclaimed I, if I could just jump back to that, uh, the previous question, though. I mean, I, I, just in response to what was being said, it, it was really good to hear that, and, you know, the, the story about closing the loop and, and, the, and um, this quality over quantity debate. Um, we, it, we impinged on it a couple of times, but the, the carbon measurement's always been a helpful one for that because it always tells you what's happened at the end and if it was more beneficial or not. And I think the more sophisticated we get in that, the more consistent we get in being able to produce a set of numbers comparative to another scenario, uh, it really will lead us to the right answer. Now, I think generally in the sector, myth busting has been a, an objective of ours for some time. It's really difficult to change people's souls and minds about what they think is a good process or a bad process. Um, mm. I like to say, why would we develop a bad process? But it, it doesn't always wash with people. You know, we're out there for the long term. We've been here 20 years. We want to be here another 20 years. We want to develop things that make sense from all angles. So we're going to pick the most efficient processes, the most cost-effective processes, because we're in a commercial environment. Um, so it's about myth-busting, I think. It's about education for everybody, and you know, it's about closing that loop with, with the real data. Sure. And to give an example, it's Patrick at Coke again. Um, a personal one, I won't reveal where I live, but my local authority has just extended the collection of of um, mixed recyclables to include some of the very low-grade plastics and black plastics. Now, I know from our investment in our joint venture bottle recycling facility in Lincolnshire, Continuum Recycling, biggest bottle recycling facility in the world. I was up there a month ago, um, and um, actually one of the operators took me to where the line had had to be stopped for 20 minutes due to some very low-grade material of precisely the type that my own local authority have just added and encouraged consumers to start putting in their mixed recyclables. Now, I don't blame that. that, So fundamentally, that is, you know, for 20 minutes, stopping the circular economy from happening and stopping our, you know, £125 million um, factory from being operational because of a decision to extend the material that can be recycled. Now, the reality is it can't be recycled, not in a um, a carbon-efficient way. 
Um, and that's part of the challenge. And when I then challenge my local authorities to why they've done that, they say it's because, because residents, consumers have asked for it. Well, you know, I could ask my local authority for many things that they wouldn't do for me. Um, you know, uh, and it, it, I think there's still a confusion um, in parts of the value chain in terms of piecing together all those elements. Um, so just a real example that I guess plays to this discussion. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, let, let, let's move on to the kind of the internal sort of engagement piece now. Um, how much of this is about staff engagement and bringing those that, that operate in the various different functions of a business along along the journey with you? Richard Mason, um, what does staff at ASDA know about, about waste and recycling and, and doing the right thing? Um, well, this is, this is one of our biggest challenges, I think, um, getting those clean waste streams that Patrick's talking about and identifying new ones um, rely upon our colleagues segregating waste properly. Um, they, we try our best to educate colleagues on why they segregate. So, for example, with food waste, we split it into uh, three different categories and we try and explain that they're putting it in this colour bag because it's going for anaerobic digestion, this colour bag because it's going for pet food, etc. Um, we try and educate them about why they should limit waste, why it should go back into human consumption wherever possible. Um, it's still the beginning of a journey. I'd say we still do have contamination issues. Um, as I touched on before, the compactor is the biggest challenge we have in this point. So if we take a compactor out, there's going to be a lot more um, recycling streams to deal with. And how do we actually get the colleagues to know and understand why they're doing it? Um, so we're actually undergoing some work with Veolia, um, looking at that education piece and how, rather than just telling people to do stuff, actually explaining why they're doing it, which remarkably um, and tends to help. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's this big challenge for us. Um, and we've still got a long way to go. So what, what benefits does, does your positioning as, as the contractor, uh, Richard Kirkman, um, what, what benefits can you bring in, in building that sort of internal story? In terms of staff engagement on the, on the whole recycling yeah, story? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question because I, I think, you know, if you go back a few years, we were a little bit behind in that area. Um, and if I looked at it, if I really looked at it honestly, you know, we were focused on going out and recycling industry's waste and recovering energy from it. And if I looked internally, I was not happy about that, the amount of recycling we're doing. And we've changed that over the past few years. And now I think we've got, you know, set up throughout the business something that makes sense, something that people engage with, something that people are proud to do. And we've started a process now of um, trialing online uh, carbon calculators for staff so they can calculate their journeys into work and are they doing the right thing and all this kind of stuff and we'd like to see ourselves rolling that out as part of the package that we give to our clients we're maybe not ready to do that today but i think that's really something we should offer as a Mm. kind of an exchange okay so watch this space on that one but we've had a a question come in from the audience it says um i work as a supplier within the marketing or comms uh sort of world of which large proportion relates to CSR and sustainability. Does the panel find that in their experience or through observation that there's a huge gulf between what organisations say externally and what staff are actually doing internally? Uh, Patrick, any, any thoughts on that one? I think it's, um, there's a challenge with big businesses ensuring that all employees, all staff, keep up with what's happening at the top and you know the sustainability agenda this whole discussion is moving so quickly um, and it is sometimes difficult to you know for example I look at our procurement um, function and they're you know critical to us in terms of driving our relationship with our suppliers and actually a large part of our of my team and their job is to ensure that they're as well briefed and understand what we expect of, of that part of our value chain um, and it, you know sometimes it's challenging I must say one of the things I joke is that from our sales team, we, you know, in the UK we've got about 2,000 field salespeople out there calling on stores on a day-to-day basis. Um, we frequently, you know, two, three times a week, we'll get uh, an email or a call from one of that, those teams, sort of saying, "Look, here's a recycling opportunity." Generally, what they mean is there's a customer who'd like a bin. You know, it's maybe oh. Dave's Cafe would like a bin. Well, actually, you know, back to that, you've got to intervene the whole value chain. That's not a recycling opportunity in its own right. Um, and when teams are, you know, their core role is not to be a sustainability expert, 
but you want them to have that level of understanding that in the same way they'll promote your brand and product, they can actually ensure that we grab opportunities that come along in this area. But, it, but it's not easy, and it's a steep learning curve, and it's moving very quickly, so definitely a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And what about the, the sort of engagement of consumers? Um, we've had a few questions coming specifically related to how you go about reducing food waste. Um, what's, what's been your experience in, in that area, Richard Mason? Um, I think it, it's almost the reverse of the last question as well. It's, it, it's, um, it's a challenge in terms of occasionally our colleagues won't fully understand what's happening. So we may be working it to reduce food waste. Or for another example, if we, in, for example, if we send it to AD or we're sending food waste for pet food and a colleague doesn't quite understand that and they'll go and actually tell someone, oh, yeah, we just throw it in the bin and it goes to landfill when actually that isn't happening. So it's that education piece again about telling our colleagues why we're doing it and what's actually happening to it. Um, I think in terms of reducing food waste, it's, um, I guess, Asda, it's a bit of an anomaly because it's the bread and butter of the company. So if you actually look at the tonnages compared to the size of our business that go to waste, it's relatively small compared to some of our competitors. Um, and that's because we're a low price retailer, I guess. That's how we pitch ourselves. So we will sell everything. So our markdown process is very thorough and we will sell everything up to it's, until it's almost out of date, which makes it very difficult in terms of donating food to charity because we sell to that last point, which some of the retailers won't do. So right. I think our colleagues tend to get the reducing food waste in terms of selling what you possibly can. I think we need to learn and we need to improve actually telling them what happens when it is wasted because I think sometimes they tell the wrong message to customers. Sure, sure. But what about the consumers? What about those that are, that are buying too much food from, from Asda? How do you yeah, go about getting to them? It's, it's, yeah, I mean, we, we sign up to Love Food, Hate Waste, and we do um, a great deal in that area. Um, but it is a huge challenge, and I think we all retailers can do much more in terms of educating people how to use food more um, sensibly and reduce waste at home. Um, again, we're perfectly positioned in the market as a low-cost retailer to be telling people how they can cut their food bills by actually storing food correctly, for example. Um, and we do do work in that, but I think I think there is more that we can do. Yeah. And what about this, the, the whole use of social media? Let's come on to the, the next in the, in the list of discussion points. Um, social media channels as a, as a way of engaging stakeholders and, and keeping them abreast of well, not only waste issues, but you know, the kind of wider sustainability debate. Uh, which of you are actually using the likes of Twitter, say, to, to encourage those along the chain? And I'm, I guess I'm really sort of thinking about consumers here, but you know, encouraging them to recycle more, for instance. Any thoughts on the use of social media? I'll, I'll comment on that, Patrick at Coke um, at CCE. Um, it's a, I, I don't think anyone's got it right yet. If they have, call me. I'd love to see it. Um, we've run some Facebook campaigns. For example, we um, uh, deliver uh, uh, recycling programs at major music festivals events. So let's say in the UK, um, V Music Festival or indeed the Olympic Torch Relay, we are running big recycling programs there. And we know that... W w that we have to talk to people five or six times to change their behaviours around recycling. Um, now, those programmes are quite good at getting people to come back and finding a second or third contact point, having maybe met and spoken to them on the road or at a festival or what have you. But the challenge with social media is if you look at what people follow and tweet or, um, or favourite or, um, around Facebook, it's things that they're really passionate about. It's saying, you know, it, it, if, you, if you see the topics that are trending on Twitter, generally it's to do with music, rock stars, footballers. Now, the reality is there is a group who are passionate about sustainability and recycling, and people on this webinar, webinar, but we're not the ones that need convincing. And we have a group we call Green Casuals, who are really what I'd call the kind of middle, middle of the road people. They, they, they want to do the right thing but they won't go out of their way to, to do the right thing sustainably, and life just gets in the way, so they have better intentions and actions. And if we look at that group, they are not, on Facebook, really into these issues. So you're trying to drive something that isn't going to be what they're interested in at 8.15 on an evening when they're, 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 they're commenting to their friends about what's just happened on Coronation Street or who's just scored the second goal for Man U in the Champions League. And that's why I say I don't think anyone's broken the back of this yet, because you'll sure get those who are passionate, the eco-warriors, but you don't need to reach them because they're already behaving in a really positive way. They're, you know, you don't need to reach them. And what I've not yet seen is the compelling 
social media campaign that reaches yeah, what I call the, the green casual, there will be a way of doing it. And we're investing a lot of time at looking at what that way is, but that's the key barrier in my mind at least. Sure. Richard Mason at Asda, any thoughts on this? Have you, have you something that you've tried to do? Um, it's, it's not with social media. I um, completely agree with Patrick personally. Um, I've not seen any any um, examples of this that have worked, and it isn't something that we're, we're very picky about what we actually communicate through social media um, for the reasons Patrick's explained. Um, that it isn't the medium to approach people on issues like this where they're not already engaged in it. Um, I think... In terms of our customers, the very same thing. We've got customers that obviously want to do the right thing, don't know how to do it, or want us to help them. But that, I, I still think that's in store. That's something we need to help them with as opposed to using social media. Um, I'm not a social media expert, but I feel like there could be things we could benefit from in terms of the experts. Two Degrees is obviously a very good example of how, how we can actually use modern technology to speak a bit more often um, with some of our suppliers. Um, and competitors as well. So, but in terms of customers, I don't see it either, to be honest. Not at this time. But what about you, Richard Kirkman? Yeah, I, I mean, it's not my area. We've got a we've got a whole team of experts here that could tell you a lot about it than me. But you know, for, for my penny's worth, I really agree with this point that you you can't um, tackle the, the people that aren't interested and get them to do something they aren't interested in in, in this way. Um, I don't know, you know, there might be some game or some app we could put on uh, an iPhone 5 and then, you know, maybe they'd come on it and they could recycle in our plants through this app. That, that's my only suggestion, what, what, albeit, you know, a made-up one. <laughs> what, what, it's Patrick again, uh, CC. One thing we're very interested in is pledging um, because, again, if you look at... Because you're talking about behavioural change. We just launched last week a piece of work with Exeter University to really get into the depths of behavioural change and recycling in the home and what people do in their kitchens. Um, but if you look at how behaviour change is driven in other parts of people's lives, so, for example, when people um, start dieting or when people train for sports events or when people you know, try to drink less or etc. A lot of the time it's by pledging and repeating those pledges that you embed that behavioural change. So this is a bit of a hypothesis but we think there's something that can be uncovered and explored there. Mm -hmm. It's one of the areas that we're, going to, we're including in this big piece of work that we're doing with the University of Exeter and it's also something where if that hypothesis um, is reinforced from that work, we expect that social media is the mechanism by which you then enable that pledging because you're certainly not going to have people you know, writing it down um, uh, on a post-it note. So that's an area which may be interesting, but again, there's a little bit of hypothesis built into that thinking at this stage. Sure, so early days in that respect. Okay, we, we, we've talked about waste targets, we've talked about engagement internally, externally, we've, we've touched on social media, and and as we've touched on, plenty of the solutions and ideas to meet these various waste challenges will no doubt be find, uh, found, found along in the, in the supply chain, and then we, you know, we've looked at that. But I, I'm keen for us now to sort of explore the kinds of innovations that are going on within business right now. Um, uh, Richard Mason at Asda, I mean, where, where are your priorities sort of placed at the moment, and where, where's your efforts going internally right now? Um, well, we're looking at several innovative projects um, which I'm sure if we can bring to market then we'd, we'd like to engage suppliers in um, looking at problematic waste streams um, but without doubt our number one is how do we get rid of the compactor in store um, and the main obstacle for that is actually our home and leisure waste so that's products that don't currently have recycling routes so home and leisure is everything that's not food basically in our stores um, we have routes for things like electricals, music video and games, that kind of thing, but there's still a large proportion of stock that doesn't actually have a route out of store, um, which seems ridiculous, but I guess that's how quickly the retail market's changed. Um, and we've currently got trials going on at how do we get these bulky items, things like tables and chairs, barbecues even, out of store. Um, they quite often have a value. They certainly um, can be recycled. Um, but it's how do we get them out intact without putting them in a compactor and then relying on someone like Veolia to actually segregate the recyclables at a MRF. Um, so increase reuse rates. Um, so that's by far and large the biggest um, hurdle at the moment. If we can get that out of our compactors, we can pretty much get rid of the compactors and we start splitting down into pure recyclates, um, which I'm sure Veolia would be very happy with. Sure, sure. And Patrick, where, where, where's, where's your efforts being placed? Where's, where's your investment going at the moment? 
Um, well, we've invested significantly in reprocessing infrastructure. So one of the things we identified as not working in the closed leap cycle was um, reprocessing of plastics. So that's why we've um, invested in, as I said, the biggest lot, um, bottle recycling facility actually in the world in Lincolnshire, um, which means that some of the material, well, a large proportion of the material which was being exported to China or um, can now stay in the UK. Um, but now one of the things that we're beginning to look at is back to the debate we were just having, which is how we invest in consumer-facing campaigns, how we begin to drive behavioural change, um, because um, increasingly we've got the right infrastructure in the UK, it's then feeding that infrastructure. Um, so it, you know, they're the two extremes of the value chain, but they're the two places where we've got particular focus. And then it's a case in the middle, working with um, the waste management companies, working with government, working with local authorities to, to connect the pieces. Sure. And, and, and touching on that, that sort of in infrastructure aspect, I was going to ask you, Richard Kirkman, about the infrastructure that's currently in the mm -hmm. UK and, and how appropriate it is right now to deal with the demands of the various waste streams. Just, just how, how do things stand at the moment? Well, we've been developing infrastructure um, for local authorities for some time now. Over the next few years, we're spending several hundred million pounds, which is you know, earmarked for investment into new infrastructure, so that's mechanical treatments and energy recovery facilities, which will also be able to take commercial waste as well. So our business has moved very quickly from landfill. It's now today not about that. It's about materials. It's about energy. And it's about the 12,000 people that work for us and getting them to go out there and sell those materials and sell, sell that energy. Um, it's about technology. We're going to be doing a big report later this year about what we think the technology will be in 2050 and how we've already started down that road. So that's really looking far out. Um, but all our kind of non-financial efforts are going into a program called Go Forward Together, which is about bringing all these things together. Um, you know, it's about our CRI index. It's about how our people think about what they do, the, you know, the culture of the people inside the company, so that we can really be what we are. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, um, is what companies say externally really what their people are about? Well, we want those two things to be the same because then it's, you know, it's, it's a good place to work and it's easier to do business. Sure. And, and thinking about your, your kind of forward plans, you mentioned at the top of the, the, top of the hour about this, the Waste Framework, framework Directive. Um, what, are you, what are you hoping to see in that that will, that will help you with these plans you have? Well, just to pick one of the things that's in there, there's, there's, there's a new end of waste regulation coming out. It's called the end of waste regulations. And that's going to be a system whereby you decide whether something is no longer a waste. You know, you formally say that. You know, we recycle a lot of paper and plastic and metals and glass today, but there's no real clear point about when that stops being a waste. So we see the businesses collecting what are construed to be wastes and then turning them back into products, having a certificate and really selling them as a product. And that will be a real change. That will, that will change the, the way the sector is looked at. We'll be someone supplying materials and energy. And if we can do that back to the customers we have who are interested to take those materials back into their products, then all the better yeah. for it. Sure. Uh, just pick up on one of the questions we just had come in. Uh, it says, have any of you considered a pallet-free solution? Um, if not, why not? This is a major generator of wood waste and a contributor to deforestation. Any experience of that among you? Um, Richard Mason from Asda. We did look last year actually at a card alternative that could be recycled um, along with other cardboard. Um, it's not quite a, a complete replacement, but um, it wasn't feasible due to the fact that it would be stored outside for long periods of time. I know other retailers that have different operation structures have imp implemented those. Um, pallets, we do recycle the wood, obviously, but it, it, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's used so heavily in our in our retail industry i think it'd be very difficult to move away um but other than that we've not had any experience right a anybody else uh, i'd just say from coke enterprise perspective secondary packaging and be that pallets be it film be it shrink wrap is something that we're going to um, focus more on over the next year or so and um, We've been very focused on our primary packaging, but there's big opportunities. But to make it happen, exactly as Richard just described, we can't do it without the retailers um, who we need to partner with. And part of the challenge is you're often 
in a position where you have to move at the pace of the slowest due to the need for a, a single solution that um, goes into it goes into the grocers. So that's part of the challenge, which is not the not the fault of anyone in particular, but it's how you make that type of collaboration happen whilst not breaking competition law. So that's one of the challenges in, in that area. Post-consumer waste is actually in one sense easier because no no one um, feels you're breaking competition law by talking to consumers, but by talking to others who are your competitors, you get into um, areas where I have my lawyer on the phone telling me what I can and can't do. Yeah. Okay. I want to sort of pose one last question to the panel, and then what I'll try and do is round up a few of the questions we've got outstanding from our our audience out there, but I want to take you back to the kind of the original concept of this this roundtable discussion, which was the, the the growing problem of urban waste. And I wonder what the panel understands by this, uh, and, and whether there's a sort of specific challenge created by the emergence of bigger and bigger cities, or whether you know the city creates opportunities for for better collaboration and smarter working practices. Perhaps uh, Richard Kirkman can kick off on that one. Well, I think you know one of the clear things, and I'll talk about it because it's one of the things we highlight in the manifesto we've launched, is the idea of commingled collection in the cities, um, in, in, in you know in housing communities. Um, there was, there's been a big debate coming through via the Waste Framework Directive about whether we should be collecting every material separately or whether we should collect commingled. And it's a difficult debate because there's never going to be one system that, that meets all eventualities, all situations. You can collect materials separately, but if you're collecting them separately from households, we're not sure when that would ever end because you're always going to want to add another material that you're going to want to collect. We don't think in, in cities with um, housing that's close together, with flats, you're going to be able to have 5, 10, 15 bins. That's just not going to work. So we focused a lot on how can we collect materials commingled and how can we add new materials to that. And it, it was touched upon earlier. There are huge issues with doing it people were encouraged maybe to collect things that can't be recycled. So you start going down this wrong road. So the challenge we've got, I think, there is to put out a message that is actually too complex for people to, to comprehend easily. People want a message that's really simple. Here's one bin, put this stuff in it. That's all they want to know. They don't want to spend their time reading literature that's 20 pages long explaining what can go in the bin, what can't go in the bin. So this idea of communicating something that has a lot of nuances to it is a challenge we're going to have to overcome. It's something we're sure. going to have to spend time on, I think. And what about Richard and, and Patrick? Do, do you think in terms of city as being a hindrance or a, or a help? Um, Patrick, um, I think that um, if you do comparison with a very urbanised country, Belgium, and then a, um, a non -ur less urbanised country, France, it's easier to drive consistent solutions to exactly what Richard was just talking about in an urban country where you have smaller transport distances and um, you're able to... Uh, there's the issue of multi-occupancy buildings, but it, 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 actually there's economies of scale that you can drive, and that's, sort of, that's true for, um, for household collection, but it's also true then for commercial collection as well. I know in the UK we're in some interesting projects live, some of which we're involved in looking at how you supply service to, you know, for example, cafes, restaurants, etc. That um, just uh, as I look across at my team and what we're trying to do in France is far more challenging because um, the distances are bigger. So there's a logistics element to it as well, which actually bizarrely means that, or not bizarrely, but maybe surprisingly means that um, delivering solutions in cities can sometimes be easier. Mm, yeah, I'd just reiterate that from Asda's point of view. Um, our biggest problems come from the rural areas. Um, North Scotland, Northern Ireland, um, within cities there tends to be better facilities available through people like Veolia um, and the logistics obviously you take out a huge cost and a huge carbon there but from not having to transport it very long, very long distances. Sure, sure. Let, let's, let's have a look at some of the questions coming in before we, before we end things. We've uh, a few to, to get through here. Um, this is a question, I guess, for, for all of the panellists, really, but uh, one of our members says, do waste contractors need to offer more of a consultancy approach to businesses going forward so that they can offer more value in terms of helping companies minimise their waste arisings and work towards closing the loop? Um, Richard, what, what's your thoughts about that? I mean, this is obviously the, the approach that you're going to go down, is it? Is that for me, Richard Kirkman? 
Richard, Richard Kirkman, sorry. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I mean, yeah, we're not, we don't act as a consultancy. I mean, we want to work with our customers to find the best solution for them. And I guess you can kind of call that a consultancy. But, you know, we, we, don't, we don't go in and charge consultancy fees to give advice. We, we give the advice um, as part of the service. And that, that's the model that we've really stuck to for a long time because, we, you know, we're about providing that waste treatment service. That, that's our sort of core, core module, I suppose. Uh, another of our members says it's all well and good partnering the larger organisations where there's a greater economy of scale, but how are companies such as Veolia helping the smaller SMEs to recycle and reduce waste? And any thoughts on that, Richard Kirkman? Well, we've, you know, we've got a number of... Uh, it's difficult to go out there and give one solution to everybody. As it's, it's, it's a business, it's, it's a great unit. You can say, are we going to put two bins or one bin or three bins? Let's go and sell that to everybody. But depending on the, the situation, how many other waste management companies are driving down that same high street, you've got to uh, hone the solution for what they want. You know, most small, medium-sized enterprises, they aren't as concerned about where that material goes so we're kind of picking up that concern for them and trying to push a better solution onto them they're not all going to pay that extra cost or you know they're not all going to do that segregation on site which is an extra cost to them which will give them a a better result on their bottom line it's it's more about getting the material off site so it presents quite a challenge um and maybe it's something that can be you know brought back into um the the local authority rules to, to to encourage them to do that sure okay in, in the interest of time, I think we ought to, to wrap things up at this, this point. Um, so on behalf of the, the Two Degrees team, I'd like to thank our fantastic roundtable panellists. Thank you, Richard Kirkman, Richard Mason, Patrick McGuirk. Thank you very much indeed for being here. Uh, and also a big thank you to our audience. Thank you very much for, for tuning in and for your contributions to the discussion. Um, as ever, we're keen to continue the conversation on the Two Degrees platform, so we'll be posting the details of this webinar it's recording in the Waste Working Group shortly, so please do use that as a place to ask any further questions, and I'm sure our panellists will be keen to, to keep an eye on that and, and to continue the, the conversation online. So uh, I hope you found that session useful, and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the platform in the near future. Thank you very much indeed.